for one. How you doing? It's good to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Any other recording devices? I think it's good. So today, on my first full day as governor, I am signing three executive orders aimed at tackling the state's housing and homelessness crisis. And don't worry about the numbers. They're in, there's three of them, but they're in different numerical order. Executive Order 2304 establishes a statewide housing production goal of 36,000 housing units per year and creates the Housing Production Advisory Council to develop a comprehensive budget and policy recommendations to meet that goal. That goal represents an 80% increase over recent construction trends, and it will take an ongoing commitment from local, state, federal, and private sector partners to move toward this target. The housing construction goal is ambitious because Oregonians are demanding bold solutions to address this crisis. I set this target to reflect, reflect the level of need that exists, knowing that we will not get there overnight or even in one year, but we will ramp up over time and keep pushing for partnerships that will increase housing construction as much as possible to start meeting the needs of more Oregonians. Second executive order, executive order number 2302, declares a state of emergency due to homelessness in regions of the state that have experienced an increase in unsheltered homelessness of 50% or more from 2017 to 2022. And unfortunately, that includes most of the state. People are currently becoming homeless faster than we have been able to rehouse people who are living outside. We must do all we can to address and prevent homelessness so we can make progress towards not just ending homelessness for individual families, but for communities across the state. And then finally, working in tandem with these two orders, Executive Order Number 2303, which will direct state agencies to prioritize reducing both sheltered and unsheltered homelessness in all areas of the state not solely those in which a state of emergency has been declared. And those agencies should be using all their existing statutory authorities to do this. These actions are important first steps. It's going to take collaboration and commitment across local, state, federal, and private sectors to make sure we are acting at the scale and urgency this humanitarian crisis demands. Now I'm going to sign the orders, and then we'll have time for questions. Governor, uh, in addition to these orders that you mentioned yesterday, you also mentioned your request for $130 million. Can you give us some more details on how you uh, how you want that money to be spent and uh, if there is a timetable you want the legislature to act on your request? Thank you for the question. We have to bring urgency to this. It's not enough to sign executive orders. So that $130 million investment, I will be encouraging our legislative leaders to work with me to move those resources as soon as possible to 
prevent more people from becoming unhoused, to help create more transitional shelter, and to provide more services to those folks who are living on the streets. It is an early investment, but it's simply not going to be the entirety of the package we need to do, but trying to do that as quickly as possible to get those resources out into the community. Governor, let's talk about, there's a lot in this, obviously. Look at the teeth involved here for folks at home, and when we'll actually start to see progress. That's a great question. So in the state of emergency as it relates to unsheltered homelessness, I would point out the key issue right at the beginning there, setting up a incident command structure, an emergency management structure, similar to what we do when there's a natural disaster. And this is a man-made disaster. This is a humanitarian crisis. So setting up that framework that local government's very familiar with, bringing an interagency approach and collaboration from the state to work with our local partners. So not only technical assistance and leadership, but also resources. We all have to work together in a new framework if we're going to make progress. As I mentioned in my speech yesterday, there are good things happening on the ground today. And we need more solutions, we need more urgency. And that executive order talks about creating that emergency management structure, which I think is a, is a new tool to the issue right now. Thank you for that question. So as you can see in the uh, order, we are addressing unsheltered homelessness in areas around the state. We clearly have a particular crisis in the metro area. Since the week after the election, I've been meeting with Mayor Wheeler. Two of those meetings took place with uh, the new Multnomah County Chair, Jessica Vega-Peterson. We've been having very frank conversations about how we all work together. It is important for Portland and Multnomah County as part of this metro structure to come together, work together, collaborate as, as best they can because we need to make sure every dollar that is out there, every resource is actually showing progress. That's a great question. I look forward to sitting down with the League of Oregon Cities, the Oregon Mayor's Association to get into the details. How I see the investment that I'm talking about today in these orders is complementary to that approach. There is going to be a longer conversation in the session about their proposal. And I've been talking to local mayor, mayors just today in the metro area in particular saying, here's what's happening. We want to work together. We're going to partner. And it's not an either or. We need to do this, and we need to consider your proposal because there is a lot at stake, and we all have to work together. Governor, there's another piece to this, the mental health component, um, when it comes to people who are homeless and living on the streets. Where is that piece of it? Because a lot of people say, look, you know, you're throwing more money at a situation, and there's still more people coming in, still more people setting up tents, but this really won't do it. Well, there are many aspects to how we're going to solve this issue, and, and I've been very clear in the priorities for our budget development and the priorities in the early months of my administration. Housing and homelessness, behavioral health, both mental health and addiction, and making sure our students have what they need in our schools. We are in the midst of developing our budget for the next biennium. Behavioral health is a top priority. We have to make sure that when people are ready for services, can we connect in the services? Is the workforce there to serve them? And it's not one or the other, we have to be doing both. I'm excited about the new leadership at the Oregon Health Authority with uh, Director Schroeder. I'm excited about uh, the new hire for our behavioral health director. We are going to put as much urgency into that side of the challenge as well as the housing and shelter side. Without the pandemic money um, coming in anymore, where are you going to get the money from? Republicans say they won't vote for this unless there's cuts made elsewhere. Well, I don't know what the Republicans are saying about the budget yet, but you will see in my budget that will be out by February 1st a commitment to housing and homelessness and an equally strong commitment to behavioral health because we have to do them together. Governor Kotek, how do you plan to speed up processes for uh, permits and reviewing for housing as that can oftentimes slow down housing construction? How do you plan to speed those up so that these new targets in this executive order can be met? Well, thank you. As I said yesterday, we need more housing. And this advisory council, <clears throat> excuse me, 
that we will be establishing the membership for, we'll be looking at all those issues. We have to break down the barriers that are keeping housing from being built or taking too much time. And so that will be a piece of it. It's also going to be about the workforce, who is going to do all this additional housing, how are we going to finance it. But I can tell you right now, we will be talking about streamlining and reducing red tape. So if you're ready to build, you're not, getting be you're not being held up by um, bureaucratic barriers. Governor, I'd like to follow up on that with a two-part question. Uh, we need more people in the construction industry, as you just alluded to. How will we get those workers? And secondly, uh, people say there's not enough buildable land. So how will you, what are you willing to do as far as increasing the amount of buildable land i.e. consider increasing urban growth boundaries. Well, Dick, you know one of the things that I've worked on is making sure we are building more and different types of housing within our urban growth boundaries. I don't think we have um, met um, our goals there. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. We have to have all kinds of housing at different levels of affordability. And you'll see in the advisory council, it's not just one type of housing, but we need all types of housing to meet different income needs. When it comes to the workforce, I was so excited to visit a lot of uh, high school programs during the campaign. who are focused on career and technical education, which we are better funding now because of the Student Success Act, to provide uh, programs for young people to think about getting into construction. Actually, some of these uh, programs are building homes as part of their school projects. We have to do that at the high school level, the community college level. We have to work with our uh, colleagues in the trades and say, look, we all have to be involved in doing this. And, and you know what? The entire West Coast has this issue. So Oregon has to be very intentional to build our homegrown workforce to do this construction, and we will. And you'll see in the advisory council that it does speak to having the Higher Education Coordinating Commission connected with that because of their role in workforce development. Well, as I said in my opening remarks, and thank you for the question, it, it's going to take time. We're not going to build all this in the first year. But we have to ramp up. We have to be ambitious. We have to work hard. Um, I'm hoping to uh, designate that advisory council as soon as possible. Um, remember, this is only my first full day on the job. Um, I'm, I'm wearing sneakers because I didn't pack other shoes to, when I moved to Mahonia, so let's, you know, so let's be clear. But we need to get that advisory council up and running. They're supposed to have initial recommendations to me by the spring, um, and hopefully we'll have some movement in the session, but definitely a full set of recommendations. And I've had some very helpful conversations with the private sector. Look, everybody's on board. People want to do this. They know that's the ultimate solution to the issues facing our state. So um, stay tuned. We'll have more details in the coming weeks. Governor, on a somewhat related topic, on the state hospital, we had public health officials under the previous administration say that there's not a lot of good options to really run at the state hospital. What do, you, what do you make of that? Do you have any ideas for what to do with the state hospital with regards to admission and capacity? We are working on that now to make sure it's reflected in the budget that we'll be releasing um, by the end of the month. We have to work on the community aspects both before people are coming in to the hospital and making sure folks who are having issues are better served in their community so they don't need to go into the hospital, for example, through the criminal justice system. And we need to make sure the hospital can uh, have more community placements when people are ready to go back to the community. And it's support about supporting the workforce at the state hospital because that is also an issue. So it is a multi-tiered problem and we are working to address it in the next budget. And I've been having those conversations with the incoming director of OHA as well. Thank you. 
Well, first off, we have to start somewhere with more urgency and a more proactive role for the state. And that's what you're seeing on these uh, emergency orders today. The proposal that we will have in the legislative session through our budget will also be talking about construction and other types of the housing pipeline. This is an early investment to deal with unsheltered homelessness. We have to make progress. And again, there are things happening in communities right now. It's not just 1,200, but the state is saying, we have to do more. Let's get another 1,200 off the streets. We have to build momentum. We have to build more services. That will increase numbers over time as well. We just can't stand still and say we don't have a complete plan. We have to start somewhere, and that's what you're seeing here today. Do you see, uh, have a number in mind of how much money it's going to actually cost down the road? Like, how much investment needs to be made? We don't know yet, but we'll be calculating that. Do you expect bipartisan support to, on your budget when it comes to homelessness and everything you've got planned here? What I have heard uniformly, both from our Democratic leaders and our Republican leaders, is an interest in housing and homelessness. It's affecting all corners of the state, and this initial investment will be really focusing on those places who have seen in significant increased unsheltered homelessness. But the order as it relates to the state, and we haven't talked about that much, we as a state, and our state agencies have to prioritize this issue. Every agency is going to be put on notice that this is part of your mission as well, dealing with housing and homelessness, making sure there are no barriers to communities getting the help they need. This isn't a partisan issue. And that I'm, you know, in my conversations with the Republican leaders, they know this is a challenge. And we have to put as much as we can together towards the problem. That's what we are going to do during the session. I haven't yet, but what I've been hearing in our early conversations, um, I did let them know what was going on here today. I think they are complimentary, and um, it's not one or the other, and I look forward to sitting down with them as early as next week with him and the Senate President to talk about what they're actually proposing. Governor, um, how will you enforce the sanctuary status of the state? And I ask this because we've had viewers that have uh, messaged us saying that they got ice knocked on their door and that they've taken family members as recently as a couple of weeks ago. So how will you as governor enforce the sanctuary status of the state for, you know, for our community that really sometimes lives in fear to say, well, will, t will today be the day that I get uh, arrested? Thank you for bringing that up. State law is very clear about what is allowed and not allowed in Oregon. And I would like to hear more about those particular incidents because we have to make sure that's not happening. And as governor, communicating with local law enforcement that they need to follow the law. Well, we have we will be able to share more of those details in the coming days. But think about it this way: it's both rent assistance, which looks different than, you know, building a new shelter, plus providing services. So it it breaks down in different ways. But we'll try to get you that info as soon as we can. Governor, yet, uh, yesterday you mentioned uh, Vic Gatia, one of your predecessors, which was a little bit of a surprise, but he was also the he was also a governor who committed to regular meetings. None of your other uh, predecessors have, com have had that commitment. You did meet with us as House Speaker regularly. You missed that, didn't you? I promised to have Peppermint Patty, so it would be great. <laughs> uh, I'm not asking for Peppermint Patties <laughs> either, but uh, I'm asking you, uh, have you decided uh, what, what kind of regular uh, contact you will have with members of the media? Well, I'll be honest, we haven't set that schedule yet. This is my first full day in the office. However, I've enjoyed my media availability when I was Speaker of the House. I think it's important to have those ongoing conversations and not wait for everything to pile up. So I'm hoping we can do that on a regular basis. We just haven't figured out the schedule yet. So. Yep. Sorry, I was just wanting to clarify what your kind of, I know you said initial recommendations likely by the spring for this team, but any clarification on what exactly you're hoping this team 
able to be able to accomplish or what it might look like, especially in those community partners who might be concerned, is this another agency we have to coordinate with or, you know, exactly what what those recommendations might, might look like. Thank you. Uh, about the Housing Supply Advisory Council? Mm -hmm. So that's a really helpful question. So the, I think what's really important is to look at how we're doing business now. One of the themes that I talked about yesterday in, in my opening remarks was accountability and better customer service. We're already approving permits now. We're already doing those things, but some of them are too long in certain parts of the state. Local government needs to be encouraged, and whatever we can do at the state to make it easier for them to do approvals, we need to get there. Um, as I was responding to Dick, we can do more production within the urban growth boundary. We don't need to have a big land use conversation right now, although that might be in the future. What we need to focus on is how do we do our business now? What are the existing programs for getting people into construction? How do we expand those? So I don't see new programs per se. I see looking at the work that we're doing now, making it more efficient, efficient and effective, and expanding those types of things that we need to actually reach the goal. Construction workforce and different types of financing um, so we can actually get these projects started as soon as possible. So we have time for about one or two more questions. Okay. Anyone had a question yet? Okay, no one's jumping in. Go ahead. Thank you. I see these, the investments we've made in the current biennium as additive to the future. We allocated money, for example, on preserving existing affordable housing. We can't, we can't lose any currently affordable housing that's out there. That could have been subsidized by the federal government in, in the past. So we have to make sure we have that. We have to continue that work. We had programs to increase down payment assistance for people to move into home ownership. We got to go down that path as well. We have to continue to do LIFT, which is a state-bonded program to build more affordable housing. All of those things have to continue to move forward, and then we've got to add on it because our goals are not being reached. That's been good work, and it has to continue to happen while we, we take on new, new issues as well. The $130 million in unsheltered homelessness is a new, more assertive role for the state with working in local communities through these emergency orders. The state is here to be a key partner we're going to put money, we're going to put talent, we're going to put energy into this because we, Oregonians have said we have to solve this issue. And that's what we're going to do um, starting today. So, thank you. Governor, I just want to touch on one, one more thing you were speaking yesterday. You talked about bringing the state back together. And the last decade, more than a decade, people built in Portland, Salem, and Chief, feel like they've been disenfranchised by Salem. They feel like the metro area is making decisions for them. Um, I guess right now, the on listening to what message would you like to send to those people who live in eastern Oregon or more rural parts of the state that still have trust in Salem and the decisions being made out here? Well, as I said yesterday, I hope that people will continue to believe in our state and the promise of our state. And I think it's looking at the actions I'll be taking. If you look at the Housing Supply Advisory Council, we specifically call out rural membership, folks on the coast, places that are also having uh, issues around housing supply, Every part of the state has a housing supply issue, and it looks a little different. I'm going to be intentional about making sure those voices are at the table so we do the right public policy and the right investments. And I tend to do that with every approach that we take. And, um, and frankly, if we're not reaching that expectation, I want to hear about it. Because this is one state. We all rise together, and I look forward to working with everybody. So. Give that divide, Governor. I think we're wrapping up. Can I just ask one last question? Sure. One last question. Will you include people who are not Democrats on your staff, given this divide we have? I don't ask that question. I don't ask people what their party affiliation is. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, everybody.